Okay, so how are we doing? Did we all have a, there was multiple sessions. There seems to be great energy, lots of chat in the corridor, which is exactly what we wanted. Is everybody still feeling energetic and, hello? Yes. Come on, yes. come on, thank you, thank you. I have a chest infection, I can't shout that loud. So come on, okay, now, I can guarantee you the three keynotes that we have to close off today are fantastic. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do three of these keynotes and I have been asked also several times, where is dinner? Dinner will be coming at 5.30 after we do the accessibility trail. So after we've done these three keynotes, I'm going to ask Michael to come up to explain to us about the accessibility trail and then we will be having dinner at 5.30. But, as I promised you, a great, great end to our day. So our first keynote speech is by Shelley London from the Poses Family Foundation. Now this is Shelley's first time here at Zero. So can we give her a really big Zero welcome, please? Oh, there you are. Just shows how blind I am. Hello, off you go, Shelley. Thank you so much, Caroline. How about a round of applause for Caroline? Terrific. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you at this wonderful conference, and a big thank you to Martin Essel and Dr. Michael Fembeck and everyone at the Essel Foundation and Ashoka for making this terrific, uh, terrific conference. It's a delight to be here. I'm going to share a little bit today about what we've learned so far in our journey to think big and do big. About seven years ago, we started with a blank sheet of paper with Fred and Nancy Posis, the benefactors of the USA-based Posis Family Foundation. We talked about what they cared about, what needed to be done, and what we could do. The cause of the one in five with learning and attention issues, brain-based learning and attention issues, was and is very important to Nancy and Fred because of their son, Max, who inspires so much of our work. Unless people truly understand these brain-based invisible issues, they can suffer from what we call the myth of mildness. They won't realize that these issues, with names like dyslexia and dyscalculia and ADHD, executive function disorder, nonverbal learning disabilities, and more, are truly life-affecting. And because they're invisible, they're often missed, even by parents and teachers. That's why far too many of the one in five experience failure and stigma early in school, and they believe that they can't learn and achieve, and they begin a downward spiral that can last a lifetime. In the USA, one out of five, the one out of five experience lower graduation rates and twice the rates of unemployment and imprisonment. Yet, when you address issues, and nurture strengths, you can unlock the potential of the one in five, and all people for that matter. There's no reason why the one in five can't thrive at the same rate as their four in five peers. So one of our earliest questions became, how do we bridge the gap between what's possible and what is? We started working in a number of areas. For example, we focused first on helping parents better understand their children with learning and attention issues by spearheading creation of understood.org with 15 founding nonprofit partners. And we also started helping people to find jobs through our workplace initiative. Our first lesson about how to think big and do big came early on as we thought about the possible scale of our impact. Set audacious goals. People with the best of intentions um, often, often set incremental goals, building on what's already been accomplished. That approach can seem very prudent in a nonprofit world where resources are limited. We believed that technology could be a powerful enabler of large-scale impact for the one in five. Yet in the earliest days of our work, the most successful digital resources for the one in five were attracting about 40,000 people a month. 
And so some people advised us to think bold and shoot for 80,000 people a month. Instead, we set an audacious goal of supporting between three and five million, <clears throat> excuse me, five million individuals per month on understood.org within five years. That's three to five million people per month within five years. We didn't pull that number out of thin air. We started with an understanding of the prevalence rate of learning and attention issues and the potential number of parents who needed help. Then we looked outside of our field at some of the highest performing digital resources for parents, for-profit and not-for-profit, to see what might be possible. In the month of October 2017, on the third anniversary of understood.org, we supported 2.3 million people. That's the month of October, one month. Of course, we have so much more work to do before the one in five truly thrive at the same rate of their peers, but we have an important start. So how did we get from a bold goal to where we are today? This brings me to the second learning that I wanna share with you. Look for unexpected inspiration. Now this might sound crazy, but one of our earliest inspirations came from what was then the biggest dating site, the biggest matchmaking site, eHarmony.com. Sounds crazy, but it had at that time the most sophisticated personalization algorithm that matched potential mates. And that became the inspiration for our own personalization. So now parents who come to understood.org can fill out a detailed and confidential profile about their children, or they can anonymously answer a few questions on the home page. Either way, they start to receive personalized recommendations on what they can need and use. We also found inspiration in a website called Making Sense of Baby. This website allowed parents to see how their babies saw the world, the blurry focus, the unsaturated colors, and more. This gave us a breakthrough idea about a tool for understood called Through Your Child's Eyes. Parents had told us how hard it is for them to understand and help their children. Through Your Child's Eyes lets parents feel what it's like to have a difficulty reading or spelling, doing math, paying attention, organizing, or more. And they watch a video from a child the same age as their own, they hear from an expert, and then they play a game-like simulation. Over and over now, parents tell us that they finally understand their kids and are better able to help them, becoming better parents. And then for teachers and others, through your child's eyes, for the first time, they tell us, makes these invisible issues truly visible. Of course, the idea of thinking big and doing big isn't simple. There are so many decisions and so many opportunities to make mistakes. So we instituted a policy called Stop the Line, which is taken from the auto industry. In many factories, um, assembly line workers are expected to stop the line if they see a quality problem. To build understood.org at high tech speed, every member of our team needed to have the authority to stop that proverbial assembly line. We saved time, avoided mistakes, and the team felt empowered. They felt ownership. The next two learnings go together. Collaborating isn't simple. We all have our own agenda, and even in the nonprofit world, egos, hate to say it, can get in the way. But we firmly believe that scale is pretty, pretty hard unless you have partners. With understood.org, as I mentioned, we have 15 founding nonprofit partners. And with our workplace initiative, we have 275 participating organizations, including a number of co-funders. We know that we couldn't have come as far and as fast without this broad and deep collaboration. Together, we have learned the power of the curb cut effect. That's the idea that an accommodation designed for some can truly benefit all. 
People in wheelchairs certainly benefit from sidewalk curb cuts, but so do parents with baby carriages and travelers with luggage. The concept of universal design for learning aims to do the same thing in the classroom and in the workplace. When we started our workplace initiative, we thought that we'd work to find jobs for people with learning and attention issues. In working with others, though, we discovered that so much of what helps people with learning and attention issues succeed in the workplace also helps people on the spectrum, people with a traumatic brain injury, and, and truly all of us. So we saw the curb cut effect applying to jobs. Certainly there are some differences, but by collaborating and focusing on the commonalities, we found a win-win approach that made hiring easier for companies and easier for job seekers. Together, in a few years, we have placed more than 9,000 individuals with all types of issues in competitively paid jobs in major corporations. Still, this is just a beginning. Millions of people with disabilities do not have jobs, so now we're thinking even bigger and we're planning what's next. As we do, we're mindful of the final learning I want to share with you today. Everyone in this room has wonderful causes competing for the attention of people in a world that has shorter and shorter attention spans. Being authentic helps communicate in a powerful way to help people understand why they should care. So here's a short video, not ours, that authentically and powerfully communicates. This video was, um, was created by the Canadian Down Syndrome Society. Beware, it has some profanity. You can say almost anything. Like, holy shit. You just had a baby. Shit, yeah. Congrats, you fucking relations. Gong hei, gong hei. She's so cute, I want to barf. Well, there goes your sex life. You just squeezed out a human. Does your vagina hurt? <laughs> I hope you are ready for lots of shitty diapers. Yay! Behold, the miracle of barking life. See, you can say almost anything. The truth is, the only bad word is sorry. 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 You're supposed to be celebrating. Woohoo! So don't be sorry about a baby. Be happy. Because every baby deserves a warm fucking welcome. Amazing, isn't it? But that's authenticity, and it's nothing to be afraid of. Be bold. Over the past seven years, we've learned so much on our journey, and I've tried to share a little of what we've learned today, but we're just really beginning in our quest to think big and do big. We'll keep learning every day, and we look forward to learning with all of you at this conference and beyond. Thank you. A little bit bold, authentic, big, and audacious. Thank you so, so much. You're gonna be around for the next few days, but I think that was just great, wasn't it? And you know, when you see videos like that, the creative is so important, but also a bit of humor, you know? And I think that's incredibly important for us. So thank you, Shelley. Um, and also, thank you for being on time. Now we have, so we're go I'm introducing Hector Minto, who's going to do our next keynote. Now, Hector has been here before, and he is known as an evangelist for Microsoft. Um, but you know, he's way more than an evangelist for Microsoft. He's like a tech guru genius. So whenever we're talking our work around inclusion, everybody says, have you hectored it? Because he is the guy that reminds us all the time of the things that so many of us miss 
because we're not experts in this space. But um, he is not only an expert, but a man with a big heart and mind. So please welcome, big round of applause for Hector Minto. <laughs> I'm going to remember that one. Yeah. So, it's uh, true though, you know, we do talk <laughs> about hectoring it. So actually, if you look up Hector in the uh, English dictionary, it means to gently bully. Uh, so, uh, you know, to, <laughs> to gently persuade uh, or to forcefully persuade. And actually, that's a big part of my role, I can tell you. Um, so uh, I can't tell you how pleased I am to be back at the Zero Project. I honestly think this is my favorite truly global event. This is a global event. So often I go to events and we, you know, we see the kind of the key markets for disability represented, but I only think at the Zero Project we really see kind of the whole world, which is just a fabulous uh, experience for me. Um, I'm going to start with kind of how I start many of my meetings. And, and unfortunately, we can't run it here today uh, because I didn't prepare properly. But here is a slide from PowerPoint. We, know, we all know PowerPoint. But this PowerPoint uh, so, uh, here on screen would allow anyone in this room to uh, plug into my app and to have live subtitles delivered on their phone. It would also allow them to be translated via the cloud onto your phone so that you could follow along in your own language. Okay? And that's just in normal PowerPoint. Is that a disability feature? Is it? No. This is a productivity feature. This allows me to send the right person to the right conference, rather than saying, I'll only send the person that can speak English. It allows you to send the subject matter expert because live translation is not going to be a cost to the people running the session. It's just going to be built into PowerPoint. At the end of every PowerPoint session, we can save that transcript and send it to somebody who wasn't able to take notes. Or any business leader can keep a, keep, a, keep a record of what they said in the meeting and go back and write their minutes up from the, uh, from the session that they gave. This is one of the key examples of how Microsoft is approaching accessibility today. Because to be perfectly honest, we failed. We failed over the last 20 years to allow people to find the settings and find the solutions to be productive. Imagine somebody uh, you know, comes into it, you're working in a in a hospital, and somebody loses their arm and has an upper limb amputation, at the point that they're taken away from the hospital or sent home from the hospital, are they given computer advice on how on earth they're going to type one-handed? Who knows how to help somebody how to type one-handed? If you all are on a Windows device and you hit the shift key five times, the right shift key five times, you turn sticky keys on. Everybody has been able to type one-handed since 1995, since Windows 95. But even when I go to specialist conferences, a tiny proportion of people know this. So the solution is not just the technology. It's about making it land. It's about getting the message out. When a, when a school child breaks their wrists skateboarding, they should be leaving hospital and being told, hey, you've got to go back to school tomorrow, so dictate into your computer and type one-handed. And here's, the, here's how you do it, because everybody knows how to do it. So we're failing to get the message across. Of course, that child who then breaks his arm uh, in 20 years' time, when he's sat there on a Windows computer and he's holding his child and he just wants to type, he's going to hit a shift key five times and type one-handed. That's true inclusive design. But for too long, we have kept these as special features for special people, so the mainstream don't care. So the challenge for us all is to make sure we find a better way to make people know these things exist. And I think the solution is on its way. Now, my main role at Microsoft is not just to come to conferences and speak to amazing external audiences, which I love, but it's also to work internally at Microsoft. We have 130,000 employees who need to know we care about disability, that we care about accessibility, and actually, we care about productivity for all. Personalization and productivity for all. So my challenge is to kind of make it matter, and this really helps me. Disability is not a personal health condition, Disability is a difference between you and what you're trying to achieve. It's about the outcome. I don't care that somebody is blind, I care that they cannot see it. And when I say somebody cannot see something, then that brings in the people who have temporary disabilities or situational disabilities because the sun is shining on their computer screen. So this really helps me sell the message of accessibility. But the other thing we have to make people understand is that accessible organizations, businesses, organizations, governments who procure accessible technology become more productive. 
We've got to stop saying it's, a, it's an obligation and start seeing accessibility as an opportunity. An opportunity for us all to learn to personalize our computer experience, to personalize the way that we present, to personalize the way that we consume and create content. And if we at Microsoft can do anything in this field, we can engage with enterprise. Businesses all around the world are using Microsoft products. We've got to make sure that they know that in a cloud-connected world and a, re a, re you know, a, a regularly updating world, that new accessibility features are going to land every month. Not every three years when you change your software, but every month we can actually affect and make changes. We've got to tell businesses that it's productivity. Not only is it talent retention in the aging workforce, people won't need to leave work. We will be the first generation that need to stay in work because of assistive technology. Yeah? But not only that, they can actually look at different types of employees. We want a diverse workforce where people with disabilities are represented and bring their viewpoint to work and help us create inclusive products. Because it's very easy to say, oh, we'll ignore that customer. That customer won't just buy our product anymore. It's much harder to ignore a colleague. Ignoring a colleague and saying, well, I'm not going to send you accessible material is much harder than saying, oh, we'll let that customer go. So we've got to embed it in every business, every school, every university. But one of the most important things that I've learned in my 20-year career in accessibility is we need amazing leaders. And Satya is an amazing leader. He has a son with uh, cerebral palsy. He, he learned late in life about disability. But if you read his book, Hit Refresh, it changed him. And it changed the way he approached work. So it's this concept that actually we've got to really make sure that Microsoft's mission of empowering every person Every organization to achieve more is every person and every organization, not just the ones who can use our products. And so Satya has really led this from the, from the front at Microsoft. Businesses care about efficiency. And accessibility is about efficiency. Personalizing your compu computer experience makes you more efficient yeah, and means that we can do more every day. So if I can quickly dictate in Office 365 onto my computer, I can just do that in every version of Office 365 and it's always there, then I become more efficient. When I was taking notes earlier in the session, I turned one note on and I pressed dictate and the audio just dictated straight onto my computer screen. I didn't type a single thing. I took better notes because I was more efficient. So we've got to sell this message of efficiency. Checking accessibility. People with disabilities should not be made responsible for making their own material accessible. This is really only landed in the USA. Globally, I can tell you, certainly across Europe, this is a subject that doesn't really come up very often. We don't have such strong regulation. But actually, when you tell people, would you like to create accessible content, they say yes, generally. So, Office 365, we changed the button location. Now, this is going to sound crazy. We, say, we changed just where the button was for check accessibility. On any version of Office that you have, if you file inspect document, you can check for accessibility. But as soon as we moved it to the front page, next to Spell Checker, we increased the global use by 500%. Five times more people in the world started checking the accessibility of their documents. It matters. We can help. So these are posters that we can provide for the workplace, posters that we can provide for the school, to stop telling people with disabilities, OK, it's your problem to make yourself accessible. It's actually everybody's problem. You know, that we should all create amazing accessible experiences. But let's not think of this as like a, an obligation again. Avoid using color as the sole means of representing important information. We should all know this. Yeah? You know, these are just good design principles, but ones that include. So accessible authoring is a subject that we're driving into our customers. We're driving into our own internal teams. Um, we have videos on how to do good, inclusive presentations. Now, uh, you can give me marks out of 10 afterwards, but this is a video that you can share afterwards. I've got a, a picture on here of somebody presenting to a diverse audience. Uh, you, can, you can share these videos just internally within your organization and say, hey, just include everybody in your presentations because 70% of people with disabilities have an invisible disability. If you're not presenting in a good way and describing your slides correctly, you're probably going to stop, you're not going to land your message. And when they learn these amazing kind of inclusive skills, they're just going to become better at their job full stop everybody will become more productive. Support is incredibly important. So we have the Disability Answer Desk at Microsoft. When we go into businesses and schools and organizations around the world, people, it's not that people don't want to do the right thing, they just feel ignorant and embarrassed that they don't know. 
So they need a bit of a crutch and a bit of support. I have this person here using JAWS at work on their Windows computer. How do I, you know, it seems to be crashing. How do I get help? And they think that's a long, drawn-out process of specialists, experts coming into their organization and cost associated with the person with disabilities. But in actual fact, it's just a free service from Microsoft where you can just get on board and meet a real JAWS user at Microsoft who can tell you, actually, this is a known bug. Relax. We're going to sort it. Yep. So we get 400,000 calls per year to our disability answer desk. But I guarantee you, maybe only 10% of this audience know about it. So we've got to drive more awareness that the support is there for businesses. And when businesses learn about accessibility, it makes it easier for them to include and, and make that hire next time and make sure they hire somebody with a disability into their organization because that perceived barrier of, oh, this is complicated, or, oh, it's an extra cost, or how am I going to make sure they can use the system in five years' time, that problem goes away if they feel that Microsoft are on board with them. So we have videos that we can share where we can show you some amazing individuals using their, you know, using their technology to be educated, to, to work, to be leaders within their organizations. But I just wanted to call out this first one, which is Andre in the first video. This is a, 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 a website I can share with you. It's called Inclusion in, Ac Inclusion in Action from Microsoft on Office 365. Andre's mum has, has a son with dyslexia. She is struggling. She thinks that she has to go through experts to do this, but she actually found her solution in the Microsoft Store from another parent of another child with dyslexia telling her to go in and check out a mainstream feature. That is a future that we want to work towards, where every high street store has the tools available for people to go and try. OK. AI. Let's look at the future opportunities. If I was to think of any single audience who will benefit most from artificial intelligence, it will be people with disabilities. And the innovators at Microsoft, the real techies, I mean, I don't know what Christine was talking about when she thinks I'm technical. Uh, you know, we have real technical people at Microsoft. Uh, they are looking at innovation around AI, and the first place they're looking is the world of disability because the, the use case is so obvious. But they've got Satya's backing here. Satya doesn't look at AI as a risk of losing jobs. He looks at it as a way to kind of get more people doing different things, building on human capacity, but doing more. We want to build intelligence that augments human abilities and experiences. Rather than thinking in terms of humans versus machine, we want to focus on how human gifts such as creativity, empathy, emotion, physicality, and insight can be mixed with powerful AI computation. What does that mean? to us today at Microsoft. What it means is new tools, new apps, apps that potentially change the social dynamic. Now, that is what technology can do in the world of disability. We're always looking at the person with a disability and thinking, what's the solution to allow this person to you know, take part? But I was so pleased in the session this morning when we talked about it's half of the population that are affected by disability. Not the 16%, it's half. Because we have families, brothers, sisters, uh, teachers who are all impacted by disability and want to do good things. So apps don't just change the social dynamic for people with disabilities, but actually they allow me to be more inclusive. They allow me to make friends with people with disabilities because it's not just about them using the technology, it's about me using the technology. My favorite experience from Zero Project last year, apart from meeting the Access Israel team, you know, that's a party, uh, was uh, the Jamaican coffee, uh, Def Can Coffee crew. Amazing. It's like people who are deaf working as baristas in a coffee shop. And she, uh, I can't remember the lady's name, but she used sign language. And I walked up to her with a Microsoft app, Microsoft Translator, and I spoke to her, and we had subtitles. So I can't sign. I can't use sign language, but the app allowed me to go and talk to her, and we were chatting for 40 minutes about the opportunities for people in Jamaica, and how could we help, and how we could we link in. We simply wouldn't have had that conversation unless I knew the app was there. I, it's partly to do with me. The other one is seeing AI. Up on screen here, we've got Saqib Sheikh with, uh, with Satya Nadella. Saqib's amazing. He's blind. He's a coder. If you ever want to be wowed by technology, there's a, there's a video of him coding live on stage in Las Vegas you know, with a mainstream audience. It's, it's awesome watching him do it. Um, but he, has, he invented seeing AI, which David kindly spoke about earlier this morning. Seeing AI allows somebody who's blind to walk into a room and offer their hand not wait for somebody else to come and say hi. 
Because if somebody feels awkward around disability and they see somebody coming in using a cane and they think, oh God, I don't know what to say, I don't know about disability, I'm scared, yeah? Well, actually, we can help them. Because seeing AI allows Saqib to push his phone around the room, see that John's in the room and go, hey John, because it uses facial recognition to tell him who's there. It changes the social dynamic. It's an amazing tool. It reads handwriting. It scans documents. It tells you people's ages. It does all these things using artificial intelligence. But fundamentally, what does it for me is it changes the social dynamic and moves society forward. Xbox Copilot. Xbox Copilot. Who, who's an Xbox player in the room? Tiny number, right? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to ask who are PlayStation players, but you know we've got some gamers in the room. Uh, there's a feature called Copilot on Xbox. Uh, I use it all the time with my kids. My eight-year-old is playing Super Lucky. We've got Super Lucky up here on the on the on the stage, and I've shown him what Copilot is. And Copilot allows two people to play the same character with one uh, one character with two sets of controls. So you share the buttons. What that means is a child with a physical disability can steer the character with his chin while his brother does the bullets yeah, and, and you know, does all the moves. This is inclusion from an early age. But my son, who doesn't have a disability, comes to me and says, hey, can you help me with this difficult move? I, don't want, to do, I, don't, I want to do some of it, but can you just help me with that, with that bit? And we play together. This is inclusive design. So where do you go next? You've heard the evangelist uh, come and talk to you. Go to Microsoft.com Accessibility. We are not here to just tell you there is a special section of tools for people with disabilities in Windows, Office, and around. We want to tell you that there's a whole bunch of things that are not just disability features, but they're just great, inclusively designed features that will help somebody with a disability. In Edge, our browser, you can right-click on any website and read it aloud with highlighting, which helps people with dyslexia. That works on PDFs offline. Yeah? These are features that, that, that you might not know about. Yeah? So we've separated all of the different disabilities. We've, we've done vision, cognitive, hearing, and mobility. And we've given you a laundry list of, we're not telling you to use it. We're just saying, take a look. There might be something that helps you one day. And I'm going to wrap up. Thank you very much. You see, isn't he great? You are definitely more than evangelist. Hector, you're around for the few, uh, right till Friday, till Friday right? Yep. Yep, yep. Absolutely. And as is the Zero Conference, please go up and have conversations because this is where the collaboration happens. So amazing. And I have to say the seeing AI for somebody visually impaired, you're absolutely right. And I love the way you frame it. It changes the social dynamic for somebody. It's so well, well explained. So thank you very, very much. Now, just before we're getting into dinner, you just heard Hector talk, uh, refer to Access Israel. Now, Access Israel, actually the country of Israel, has had a very prominent um, positioning in the Zero uh, Project and Conference, have become great friends of ours, where there's been real, real um, innovations around best practices and policies. And so we've had a huge amount of our Israeli colleagues around with us. But key to all of that, and I gotta say to you, for those of us who know Zero very well, is our friends in Access Israel. And it is wonderful to finally have the founder of Access Israel, Yuval Wagner, here to close today. So can you give a massive big round of applause? Because we love these guys. While Yuval is just getting onto the stage, um, I'm going to let you know we found the video, uh, the Formula One video that Rodrigo was talking about earlier on today. And after Yuval has finished speaking, we're going to play it so you can see it. I think everybody's really interested in seeing what's going to happen. So if you just hang in the room, I will, pre I will say play and then we'll give the video a whack. So take it away, Yuval. We're dying to hear what you've got to say. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to thank a lot the Essel Foundation, Zero Project, Martin, Michael, and all the staff for being such great partners and friends. And it's an honor that you invited me to, to be here with you today. And uh, thanks again to challenging me being the third speaker after Shelley and Hector. It's uh, quite a challenge. So I'll try to do it my best. 
I was born to a father who was a paraplegic confined to a wheelchair due to an accident. All my childhood, I had to cope with barriers that avoided my father to come with me to places and activities like all other dads. My personal experience in pushing my father's wheelchair made me an accessibility expert on all barriers around my house. At the age of 20, I became an Israeli helicopter pilot. A few years later, I survived a helicopter crash due to a technical failure in the motor. It was a true miracle that I stayed alive, but as a quadriplegic from the neck down, lucky me, I stayed alive. 19 years ago, the accessibility in Israel was a disaster. Nothing was accessible, nothing. The situation was unbearable for me. I felt like I, like I got punished twice. Once, the disability itself and all it came with. And secondly, the feeling of home arrest. The idea that nothing has changed. The idea that my three kids will have to feel and go through what I went through as a kid, this was unacceptable for me. Something had to be done. I understood my life mission is to make Israel accessible. Access Israel, founded in 1999. What's unique about Access Israel is this is the only NGO in Israel that is focused on one mission, accessibility, for all kinds of disabilities and all areas of life. For us, accessibility is the only way to achieve the real target, full inclusion for everyone. The Zero Project Conference 2018 emphasizes on accessibility. So I would like to both share a bit of our best practices and our plans for the future. Today, 19 years since we started, we have revolutionized Israel accessibility landscape. In Israel 2018, we already have awareness to the importance of, the, of accessibility, a set of detailed legislation, regulation, and standards hundreds of professional consultants, we enforce compliance, and we have an active and successful commission of equal rights of people with disabilities, and the commissioner himself, a true partner of Remy Torim, is here with us today. Besides places that justify exemptions, all businesses are due to be ac fully accessible, or actually already fully accessible right now. Government ministries will be fully accessible by the end of this year, and municipalities by the end of 2021. Today, every new building, business, website, park, and etc., must be accessible from day one. Access Israel created a unique accessibility implementation model for businesses and organizations that must make sure that all its physical spaces, services, and products are accessible and usable to all. The idea is to make sure that all means that are taking place between the organization and its clients B2C will be fully accessible for all, aiming to serve 100% of its clients. That means including people with disabilities and the elderly. We found that implement accessibility in large organizations is very complicated and expensive. 
So using our consulting unique implementation model, we have managed to make it simple and affordable. In Israel, we use the slogan, accessible business equals profitable business. We issue an accessibility badge to accessible organization to motivate them. Organizations that are fully accessible are now being implemented, are now being implementing new advanced model of maintaining accessibility for the long run and excellence. We have learned and understood that we should focus on large organizations like ministries, municipalities, businesses, because their impact will be the strongest and will affect the maximum amount of people with disabilities. Today, organizations implement accessibility for the following reasons. Enlarge profits and users, improve organizations' image, avoiding risk of lawsuits and shaming, corporate social responsibility, and compliance with accessibility laws. Today, many decision, decision makers are entirely devoted to our cause. The, evolu the evolution of accessibility started many years ago. Accessibility, accessibility of the physical environment that developed to cultural accessibility, dealing with stigmas and the way people see and react to people with disabilities. Next and still today, we deal with accessibility and usability of services, and still ahead of us, we have accessibility of technologies and products. The future is all about technology. Everything will do will be based on technologies. Autonomous cars, robotics, argument and virtual reality, Internet of Things, smart home and smart cities, and much, much more as you already heard today. We realize that we have an historic opportunity we never had before. This is the first time in the evolution of, access of accessibility that we have the possibility the will and the power to create accessible world from day one. A world where we won't have to retroactively deal with accessibility, but rather tackle it in the present. Accessibility by design. In Israel, website, application, automatic machines, already must be accessible day one. That's a great starting point, but what about other future technologies? An, auton an autonomous car, for example, can be great, but if it doesn't have a ramp for users like me on a wheelchair, or if a blind person wouldn't be able to operate the car with voice, or if a deaf person wouldn't be able to operate the car with captions, then this is a great tech invention, but it, in, it excludes people with disabilities. And when the technology will have such a large part of our life in the future, excluding people with disabilities equal house arrest. That means we are enlarging the social gap rather than making it smaller. So we, all of us can't let it happen. Our action item in Israel for the mission are based on our models and experience. We're going to create awareness. We're going to import global accessibility solution, getting large organizations obligated, legislation laws that all B2C tech must be accessible, teaching the end users how to use those technologies, developing tech accessible consulting services, and development of innovation solutions. We are fully engaged to this mission in Israel. Our focus 
is take accessible solutions and services in the area of B2B2C and not assistive technologies where are being dealt with successful, are being dealt successfully by others. Israel is known as a startup nation. We have many innovations that can be life-changing for people with disabilities all over the world. Some of them are here at this conference. You can or come make sense and and Malev sign the the speaking sign and step here. I invite you to contact Access Israel to learn more and connect to Israeli innovations, startups and technologies. We love to help. We have learned that the global companies are well aware of the importance of accessibility solutions. They have accessibility directors, R&D teams, working on various solutions, and already, already have available some product and solution in place. But we also noticed that they are not 100% obligated to be accessible by design for all products and all services. They don't export and implement and localize the accessibility products and solutions globally to all countries in the world. The impact that global companies have on tech accessibility and therefore on inclusion and equality of life and social gaps over the world is enormous. The global company's obligation is critical to make the future tech era accessible worldwide. We all have to work together to urge the global companies like IBM, Microsoft, Cisco, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and many more to be fully obligated. This is the right business social decision case to enlarge business sales, to lower, lower future costs of redesign the accessibility, improve their image, corporate social responsibility, risk management, low compliance, and all the other reasons that Hector mentioned before. The time is right. It's now. We are in a historical moment in which all of us together, 15 to 80 percent of the world population, more than a million people with disabilities, can shape the future of the tech era, making it accessible day one. Together, we can make it happen. This is an opportunity we can't afford to miss. Neta, all our great progress I just presented, I could not achieve on my own. I'm surrounded by amazing people who are dedicated to the mission. One of them was Neta, who is unfortunately is no longer with us. Two days ago, while preparing for Zero Project Trail, she was killed by a crane that collapsed on her. Neta was a true partner, a leading professional and a change maker in accessibility in Israel and the world. Access Israel is dedicated to continue fulfilling Neta's dream. Thank you very much. Yuval, thank you so much. Um, and I have to say, um, watching um, in the last few years what Access Israel has achieved is phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal. The passion, commitment, the team, and the people that we've got to know, you are absolutely, you're legends. You are just legends. So it's wonderful to have you here with us, Yuval. So thank you so much. Now, I'm just going to ask Michael to come up and join me, just explain a little bit to you about the access trail that you can do on the ground floor before I play the video. Um, she'll do a much better job of explaining it than I will. Um, I know many of you met her before. She's a partner in crime, another troublemaker. So would you like to take over and tell us all about the trail? Absolutely. OK, guys, after the short clip, I think we sat enough and we talked enough and we heard enough and it's time for a little action. So 
once we're finished here, I'm inviting you to come downstairs to the accessibility trail at the entrance of the conference. You can do a little, uh, you know, relaxing your body and getting ready for a, a real action. Each one of you um, uh, can choose the way to participate. Some of you will say, listen, I just want to stand on the side and just see what people are doing and when I'll be ready, I'll participate. And others can join groups. You'll hear me uh, talking uh, uh, on the speaker and inviting groups for specific uh, um, uh, experiences there. Others can come just to the entrance of the trail and once it's free, choose a disability, blindness, or sitting in a wheelchair and try to experience. We have amazing innovations there from many countries around the world that really show you not only the difficulty, but the fact there are solutions. And this is what we want to show here. So I urge you to come. Let's you try passing by me and not participating. Good luck. You know, I believe that. Hold on, just stay right here. And actually, that is one thing that is really about Access Israel. And it's just in referring to you, Val's point, you guys are so open to share a lot of your innovations and work. And also, any question. I mean, any qu no question is stupid, right? No question is stupid. And it's also have fun. So it's to have fun before dinner. So a big round of applause. And I'm going to now ask, can we show the video? Uh, a huge round of applause for you, Val, and Access Israel. A Fórmula 1 marcou muito a minha infância. As corridas aos domingos, os grandes pilotos, aquela emoção toda. E agora estou eu aqui, me preparando para pilotar um carro de corrida. Ah, você está brincando. Olha isso. A largura do pneu. Nossa. Olha o tamanho. Esse capacete é o seu volante. Ele capta suas ondas cerebrais e traduz em comandos para a direção do carro. Direita. Esquerda. Acelera. Uau! Você está pronto, Rodrigo? O que vai colocar as pessoas em condição de igualdade é o respeito às diferenças, é a sua atitude. What a great way to end day one! So I just want to say that wraps up today's uh, keynote and plenaries and conversations. Remember, our job now is to connect and have fun. But I just want to thank our three keynote speakers, Shelley and Hector and Yuval, for a great end to the day. Yeah, like brilliant, because it's hard to do it in the end. That was a really, really good ending. So now, everybody, off you go. Mikhail will catch you. Enjoy the accessibility trail. Enjoy the dinner and be back in this room. And I mean it no later than 8.40 a.m. tomorrow. Okay? Thank you, everyone. <laughs>